podcast. Uh, this week, we're going to be discussing a uh, film uh, titled Belle Noju, Noju uh, which I probably butcher because I don't speak French. But, you know, um, it's directed by uh, Luis Buñel, uh, who's actually, um, he has an interesting story to actually start off a little bit, if you didn't know. He, uh, he's actually Spanish, but because of the political situation with Franco, he actually, most of his life lived in Mexico. Um, cool. And, uh, you know, I won't talk about Spanish history too long, but I, I find that interesting because also he learned to like, uh, he worked in the French film industry because obviously he wasn't allowed back in Spain. Uh, but I think he also, he did film work in Mexico. So that's a little trivia thing. Um, so this film, you know, I, I added it to our list because it's it's intriguing in many ways. It you know touches upon different topics and also how it's filmed is, is intriguing, especially for like the '60s. I believe this film was filmed in 1967, so it's it does it's actually I've I've seen it tw uh, twice now, so I feel like it's some things I can tell that it's like older, but like it's it's a, it's a very uh, I think watchable film for like this century. So. I'm kind of curious about your like initial thoughts because I think just off the bat in the beginning, even like in the first 20 minutes, you can definitely sense that you're gonna you're you're gonna watch a different type of movie. Yeah, so my initial thoughts are, I guess, two things. Like for one, you have to understand a lot of the cultural. We're both in America. We're we're both Americans, so there there's a big cultural difference between what is sort of acceptable to talk about and more like taboo here versus within French society at that time. In 1967, a lot of these topics were pretty taboo, I would say. Like, you wouldn't necessarily talk about, like, a lot of the themes within the film uh, of Belle de Jour. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't speak French either, but that, that's my best attempt. But a, a lot of the themes that the film deals with and topics were... I would say more taboo here in the U.S. during '67, whereas I'm not so sure that they were necessarily as taboo within uh, French society uh, at that time uh, <clears throat> and even today. But uh, my initial thoughts were the the film was pretty interesting. It delves into you know a, a lot of uh, I would say more re repression that people have um, towards certain needs. And uh, that is sort of uh, shown throughout the film, throughout the main character, which is uh, Severine. I, I don't know exactly I, I how think, to say I think how you pronounce it is uh, Severine. Or Severine. Severine. Yeah, I, I'm sorry for butchering that. Like, yeah, I, I don't speak uh, a lick of French. If the, the Spanish, other, other, in in, in your it. defense, the other characters are easier with Pierre and Marcel. <laughs> yeah, Pierre yeah. is okay. Or Michelle, yeah. Um, or, so, uh, or Henri. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, so so this, this film's interesting at the time because it, it touches upon a lot of more taboo topics, whereas uh, like a lot of these themes have been more explored with uh, like say Stanley Kubrick's Eyes Wide Shut, or even the more sort of cliche, um, you know, more more and it was a very popular film, but it was, uh, gosh, uh, Fifty Shades of Grey. Like a lot of these topics were more discussed uh, within more modern times, but I could see this being very sort of new and uh, very interesting to a lot of people because it uh, it was probably more taboo at the time. Yeah, and I think what's interesting about this film is that even the title, right? Like Belle de Jour, like yeah. it's the title of the movie is her basically her hooker name, right? Um, yeah. So I also find that interesting. Also, with this film. We see we saw this with burning actually, where like you use like you use techniques to like uh, show foreshadowing or like um, uh, like like hint at like a larger story, right? Like there was these random scenes where she's in the church as a child, right? Or that awkward, weird scene where she's being kissed by some kind of older man on the cheek, and it was very uh, let's just say unsettling. Like it's it's almost those things are there to go deeper into her own psychology, you know. Yeah, I would say some of the foreshadowment was a bit too on the nose, where it was like, okay, like this is a little ridiculous. But one thing I will point to is when her husband looks at the wheelchair and he's just drawn to it and he's like, why are you looking at that? I don't know. I just can't stop. I was like, okay, like you're going a little too, like you're trying to like hit that foreshadowing on the head a little too much. There's no subtlety there with that one. Yeah, and, and but what's interesting is that when we get to the ending, right, you're left wondering like, what it is like, did it all happen or did it not happen? What parts did happen? Because there's a lot yeah. of these scenes, right? That like 
you know that they don't seem real. They're surrealist. That's, uh, I guess that's the right term, right? Or yeah, she's like in the beginning where she's getting like mud on her. I was just like, dang. Uh, the uh, but uh, what'd you think of the what's this what's this uh, character? So obviously, so we're in the beginning, right? So in the beginning, it seems like she's a very like she. You, you, they keep mentioning that she comes from privilege, right? Like she is yeah. somebody that like has basically had everything handed to her, and she has a you know supposedly on paper a great husband. Um, but you can see like there's I, I guess I, I have to give the actress credit because like she does her she's uh, very good I thought yeah she gave little nuances where like you can tell that she was even though there was this persona of a beautiful flower like she didn't feel like she was that right she felt like that wasn't well, a standard was, that she wasn't like she can't uphold yeah so um, she like the society because she comes from more of the elite class uh within french society you know they have all these sort of perceptions of her and uh like a lot of times it's like oh you come from all this money her husband's um a doctor or surgeon you don't really he, he works at the hospital right and it's hinted based on like her house and living standard she they do pretty well right she comes from a lot of money and her uh, husband obviously makes a lot of money and so based on that and your perception she should be you know very happy given that uh the comfort of her life and her lifestyle but it's hinted from the beginning i mean the, the whole thing at the beginning was her sort of fantasizing about uh or yeah basically being degraded right and, and so that's uh some of her sort of sexual fantasies that uh she's sort of imagining and she obviously wishes that her husband would be uh, yeah, a little more dominating towards her. You know, that's uh, that's what attracts her. But he's not, he's a very nice guy, uh, sort of gives her space a lot, and she's not really attracted to that. Yeah. What did you think of her interactions with um, her husband's friend, Henri? I found him to be kind of like that, I think, stereotypical, like... Very stereotypical play- French man, too. Yeah, playboy ish. That like he has no problems going to the brothels, flirting with another man's wife. Like very like, like if I if I was in public with somebody like that, I would just be like, we're not probably speaking again because this is totally out of line. You know? Right, and, and what well, he just has no filter. Right, he says whatever he wants, and he's just like, oh, that's just me. That's that's who I am uh, essentially. But it's just like hearing some of those conversations on the topics that they're speaking openly about. It's like, whoa, it's a big contrast from what you would expect to hear in typical conversations within American society in 67. I always want to sort of compare the two because it's just wildly different on that, that sort of speak is like pretty acceptable. Uh, yeah. Or even visiting apparently the brothels was sort of uh, okay within French society at that point in time. It's like, that would be very taboo here in the U S. Yeah. You would never mm-hmm. expect to hear that in normal conversation. Yeah, it's only happened to me once, and even then, I was very lukewarm. The, uh, it's very, oh, but it, it's not. It's not the norm, is what I would say. Whereas, like the two main characters are like talking about that, or like, yeah, yeah uh, the, even the wife asked her husband, "Oh, have you have you been before?" And he's like, "Yeah, I've been once or twice." But he's like, eh, like he's like the times I've went, he's like, "You're just full of shame after." So it's like, it wasn't his sort of. Um, a cup of tea. Yeah, but with uh, his friend Henri, like you, you, uh, you Henri said- is, is it's very interesting because um, Pierre and Henri are just two totally different people. Yeah, in terms of personalities. It, since this is like more of a character-driven story, what do you, what did you think of the Madame, the the lady that was running the the brothel? She was her character is very intriguing too because it seemed like she was also like. She was, um, I mean, she was she interesting. She's very understanding she, at times, uh, but still very forceful. Right. She was like, a bit I, towards like, there's hints that like, she was pretty infatuated with the main character, you know? Um, you yeah. Know, I, I mean, she, she gives her a kiss. Like, uh, yeah. I mean, it was. Uh, I, I don't know if she was infatuated as uh, as much as she just really, like, I can't tell if there was attraction or she just really like liked her as a person. I think. It's really hard was, to tell. Yeah, it's hard to tell, but I I will say that like her towards the end asking for like the address or phone number, th- that was a bit more. I wasn't expecting that. Like even yeah, I'm not so sure. It's more. I think she just wanted to like it could be, but it could very well be that she just wanted to keep in touch 
I think she's very hurt that she was going to see her go. Yeah, I, I, I did also find it very weird in the film that uh, the madame would allow her daughter to come uh, to her god, her goddaughter. Right? Oh, is that her goddaughter? Still, yeah, it wasn't her daughter. So, yeah. Still, someone she uh, cared very much for, and was so young that she would allow her to even be seen in a place like that. It's very strange to me. Yeah, it's. Um, I agree. It was. It, also, those interactions were like the. I, I, we'll get into like the the little racism with the Asian guy, but when he's like looking at the like the the, the underage girls, just like man, this is definitely a different film. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because I think the other other I guess there's like these obviously there's sequences where like it's surreal, right? Where she's getting like whipped in the beginning or thrown dirt or other other surreal kind of like in her mind how like i guess like you said her repressed sexuality but most of the movie is like obviously the beginning the crazy end but in the middle it's a lot of the scenes of basically all the different people she's uh her her, her customer clients right uh -huh. right there's the first one who was to basically i like how they're all prototypes of like i think a lot of what we assume as maybe viewers who go to these places right like the first one was this guy that throws money he loves the booze and he likes to have the fresh girl you know yeah, and, and then the you, second one was the dude who just wanted to be completely degraded by... Uh, yeah, degraded, woman. right? Getting stepped was, on. It's very interesting. That like, was he was like, there with a whip, uh, whipping the bed. I'm like, okay. Yeah, they, <laughs> they definitely wanted to touch upon different stereotypical, I guess, um, uh, taboo sexual topics like that. Yeah. Thing, th really, really odd things that some people would be into. Yeah, and then the I think the third one is the I'm gonna say for the time because if we look at a modern lens, it's a bit racist, right? Like he doesn't. If you notice, like there's no subtitles for his lines, really, because he's just speaking. For which um, one? Uh, the eight. The I'm gonna say China. No, man, no, no. But, the, yeah. the, uh, but the person I was referring to was the doctor from I believe it was Amsterdam. Yeah, the, that was the second one, I think. Right. Yeah, it's that was the second one. Like, so you're she about has, the third one now. Yeah, she peers through the hole and like yeah, and she's like she can't believe that he wants to be like so treated like such but yeah, yeah like, the, the, that, that, that was a scene that fascinated me because she's like look she even says she's like i don't know i looked at look at him in disgust and i'm i was like okay you're you're sort of one to judge right yeah the uh but obviously the the one with, like the the one that follows right the with the uh, the the asian uh foreigner um uh, he he, uh, he doesn't like he speaks broken french because like um Right. You know, there's no. What was what was with those bells? I did not understand. I don't know about the bells, but I will say that the this is where I, I, it's like you said with the chair and other things. There was a lot of like on top, like like you know the it was very foreshadowing, like so obvious. But like you notice that like he shows his device to girls in the box, right? Mm -hmm. And he, one girl like what says, was oh, that? Like, it, yeah, there's a lot of like there's no clarity, right? Like uh -huh. they show the box. One girl says disgusting. Severine says, I guess she'll do it. And then remember when the lady comes in to clean, there's a little bit of blood. So I have a theory. My my interpretation is that, um, by the way, this, how do I say this? Like PC. But yeah. it was probably hey, like. Choose your words carefully. Um, let's just say that it was probably non conventional uh, inter Acts. intercourse. Yeah. Okay. Um, we, maybe after we stop recording, I could give you what, specifically sure. what I mean, but, but because I think there's little hints that like one girl turning away her looking exhausted after, and then like the little bit of blood, I think we can just kind of, yeah, I mean, that, like what look, it was. A, a lot um, of this film centers around BDSM, right? It was like yeah. sadomasochism. So it, it could have been any sort of number of things. Cause that's a specific subculture of yeah. Um, sexual relations. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, so I think with with these films, uh, I mean, at least with these scenes, like you see, like you're right, they're covering different angles and then also different kind of like niches. And I think we we're well aware that these do exist, but like you said, on camera, we don't really see a lot of these kind of movies unless it's like NC-17 or like really niche. Yeah. Well, within this film, you don't see any nudity, so that, I think that's what prevent. Like they they delve into these taboo topics, uh, but there's nothing sort of outwardly graphic about it. That's true, yeah. Oh, yeah, and there's the other guy I totally forgot that she just meets, right, in the cafe. And they and that was weird to me. I'm curious about your thoughts with the freaking I, uh, funeral and then, like... It, it, for some reason, it, like, he was very attracted to the scenario of 
uh, the woman he loves being dead. Again, and, and, and so that, that's, that's what really sort of gets him in the mood, if you will, which was very strange. But again, they, they really want to delve into many different scenarios that people are really into, you know, very taboo, um, especially in the 60s, man. I, I can't even imagine what a lot of people's thoughts were uh, around the world with, within uh, about this film. Uh, given the time period. But yeah, they wanted to delve into different things that people could be into, right? Especially nowadays. So the, I think this film was really sort of showing, you know, uh, a lot of the taboo things that were going on. And now things that people would consider taboo in this film are like, ah, oh, they're child's play, they're amateurish compared to, you know, what some people are openly into today. I mean, even in our hometown, there, there was a furry convention. So you just people uh, see walking around downtown. If y'all don't know what furries are, go ahead and look it up. Just uh, be careful because it's another very odd uh, sort of subculture uh, as well. But yeah, so they're just trying to touch upon different um, uh, different subcultures that could be out there that, um, that exist within society, especially French society at that time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We, we can get more into that later on. But yeah, that's that's yeah. that's about where I want to leave that. <laughs> okay, that's fair enough. The uh what did you think of the husband, Pierre? Right? It was it was tough to watch him at times, to be honest with you. Uh yeah, yeah he, I mean he's seems, trying to do his best as a, like a traditional he's, well, he's like, male very, husband. Look, he comes from the elites, he's a very nice, loving husband. It's just that that's not all that his wife wants of him at times, right? She, he wants her to be more forceful. Yeah, I yeah. mean, uh, yeah, she wants him to be more forceful, right, at times. Because uh, uh, that, that's sort of what she fantasizes about quite quite often. And so, yeah, a, lo a lot of what this film deals with is how I believe at, at that point within sort of the elites of French society, you know, a lot of them feel repressed in, in some of their desires. Yeah, I mean, to the little tangent here, but it, it's gonna connect. Is that the, that whole dynamic reminded me of like uh, I'm not done with the book, but I've been reading the famous book, uh, The Feminine Mystique, and there is actually a whole section around how women, especially in the 40s and 50s after World War II, you know, they were taught, they were told that like what's important is be a good wife and mother, right? So clean the dishes, do the laundry, mm -hmm. you know, vacuum, and then be very um, uh, you know, whenever your husband needs to be satisfied, I'll use that term, you know. Yeah, you, your, you, you had role. all of the all of the womanly duties. If you yeah, and what's like interesting that. about the, the section of the book I was reading was that it talked about how, like, women would do it and then they wouldn't feel, you know, they wouldn't feel engaged. They, they saw their husband was happy, but they were like, okay, if my husband is like, if I'm not getting anything out of it and I'm not getting anything out of my everyday chores, you know, you know, the book was talking about how this is how we were seeing elevated like anxiety and, and, and people, women going to psychiatrists because they were like, our society is telling me all this, but I don't feel satisfied. I think well, this yeah, it, it, it was like society at that point was geared towards, um, you know, the husband's needs and desires. And unfortunately, like uh, there was a point in time where, you know, there, there was, if you were married, there, uh, society this uh, or at least legally there, there was no uh recourse against spousal rape right and so if if uh if you were the husband and um you know you were in the mood like the woman they uh, within certain parts of society there there was no legal recourse against spousal rape right which was sort of mind-blowing but i think that also just uh, yeah, there, there were just a lot of things that were always pushing against sort of woman's needs, right? At least legally. That's how society was geared. Yeah, so what I find interesting with that dy the, the dynamic with the, the wife and Savine and Pierre is that this movie is made in 67. I can't remember what year that book came out, but it's around the same era of the second wave of feminism. And I think if, either intentionally or not, you see that like that her character and her husband and her relationship with her husband does exemplify that dynamic of she clearly like you said like doesn't get enough of her current relationship with her husband and so she's seeking something else and i think a lot of women of that era 
felt that they felt like, well, I can't be anybody outside a mother wife. And it's not satisfying me even in sometimes in the bedroom, but also just, you know, my, you know, I have no, what's the term? I, have no society. I have no identity outside that identity. And I think, right. you know, it obviously feels like she's thought, put in a box. Exactly. And I think this yeah. film does a, a good, through film does a good way of kind of conveying that even though it's a bit like at the time you could say risque it's very risque and, risque and that's why i say like i was like it definitely deals with taboo topics at the time yeah and so i i think i think by convention i think because this is part of the dynamic and portrayal i think that's why pierre is like he's shown not to be a bad faith actor right like there's tons of easy examples of like bad husbands drinkers or whatever but he's actually shown to be like what most women would consider like a good, yeah. good stock and and she still isn't super satisfied. he's a super understanding dude like yeah. uh he clearly loves his wife but that's not enough uh for her in this film yeah and so um it seems like we'll get to her i would say like <laughs> the, 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 the fling she likes the most marcel who is basically a criminal yeah what do you, you think of his character a, that guy was eccentric i will say he, he, I, I thought as an actor, he was very good, right? He, like, he just plays sort of the, the creepy, like, sort of pretty scumbag uh, gangster role. I mean, it, it's to the point where he even has a bunch of fake silvery teeth. Just look really creepy, like, when, when you first see him smile, right? Just, just I, I think that's what they wanted to show, that he's a complete contrast from her husband, right? Even when he, he's a gangster, so he participates in illegal activity, he's very forceful. In many ways, he's he's the antithesis of her husband, and he just gets like insanely jealous at the end. Yeah. Speaking of that, so what I find interesting about his characters, I think this is a. And I, I, I I think they uh, the one, one last thing I, I think they wanted to sort of portray, uh, portray um, you know, some of the dangers within that work as well, where I think a lot of Johns can uh, tend to develop feelings for, um, you know. It's, uh, some of these, uh, oh, I, I, at this point, they're, they're like high-end escorts, at least within the service. Uh, so they, they tend to sort of develop feelings and get overly possessive of some of the escorts that they see. And that can put uh, a lot of these sex workers in danger. Yeah. I, and I, to go even deeper is that I think <coughs> Marcel's character, actually, he, he did, like, he, it was like the, I, wanna, I say cliche, but maybe at the time it wasn't cliche, where like he basically falls in love with the escort, right? That's basically what happened. Yeah. That's what happens to him. Or he does. Yeah. But, but what's interesting is that what I see, and obviously the counterpoint is that like he only interacts with her through this basically form of exchange, right? They don't really, she doesn't, he doesn't really know her life outside there, right? No, but he just but becomes so involved with her, the idea of her. Yeah. What's interesting is that th that those kind of, uh, I don't want to say pitfalls, but those kind of attributes I see in today's society around people who are following YouTube celebrities or Instagram models, yeah. where they project they project this uh, basically this, infa this infatuation because maybe this person responds to their questions because you know it's more you know uh, interactive in the modern day social media hyper celebrity era, but they project this and like you know when they have like oh here's my mailbox send me gifts boom they send stuff like they put the money where their the mouth is you know and i and i see like the attribute of like maybe they're not getting sex like uh, marcel is but they're projecting like this artificial relationship that well, doesn't exist. they just sort of have the idea it's kind of like i mean this is nothing necessarily new that type of idea of becoming obsessed with the celebrity right i mean even um oh my gosh this is gonna kill me uh even one of the member uh, john lennon one of the members of the Beatles was killed by an obsessed fan in New York City, right? Yeah. So it, it doesn't even have to go with uh, with the opposite gender or uh, attraction that way. It's just becoming obsessed with someone that you sort of idolize, if you will. And that's nothing new. I think it's just become more heightened in today's society because of social media. Yeah, because I think somebody, let's say they only have 200,000 followers, right? That's still a lot, right, compared to what you and I have. But right, two hundred thousand is not like fifty close. million, right? Yeah, yeah, like it's not like like a big so like celebrities who are at the top. They are used to right. They have the Kardashians. Like Paris, Paris Hilton has like twenty five Kardashians, at like twenty five million or whatever the number is. But somebody who has two hundred thousand probably has enough to be an influencer, but not like crazy, like you know, on MTV on E News, right? And they probably you know honestly like they probably can respond to some questions and be friendly 
and that could be especially for a female that could be misconstrued to be maybe like oh this this girl's talking to me i'm you know she there's a future here and now seriously and I, i've seen this all over all over and over again on forums i don't and, yeah. I, and I go do you even talk to this person outside of this like she's answering like trick questions that she could answer to anybody like i don't know why you're projecting but but it happens and i think this film what i like about it is that it's the same dynamic right like it but it's obviously in a different setting where he's in, he's 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 calling the the brothel every like day right and even his uh, supposedly friend mentor is like you know to be young is to make these kind of mistakes you know he makes a, a line around that you know that like he's he's making the mistakes that he's seen a lot of young men do for es like falling in love basically with an escort yeah there was uh just going back to a little bit of you know your, your sort of commentary about social media and how people like uh will like comment and you're uh on certain uh, people's instagram accounts and you're like why are you like and they they sort of project profess their love or just say all kinds of random things to them it's like what are you doing this is like a person who's got like 250,000 followers and they think that they're going to respond but um sort of a funny story but apparently there was uh someone put a uh made an Instagram account. I, I heard this from a comedian on a podcast, which I'm, I'm not going to name it, but I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, they were talking about how, I guess someone put a, um, made an Instagram account of someone who was a very attractive woman, except it was a painting, right? And so it was a paint, it was like a, a series of paintings that looked very realistic and people were just flooding comments, not realizing that this was no real person, which was a, a pretty funny sort of like trick and trap. <laughs> interesting yeah, yeah. and so I it's mean, funny because you're, you're commenting uh to someone who you think is a real person but it's actually not a real person at all yeah the social experiment i've heard <laughs> about is like um they this person took like random uh kind of like youtube like good looking youtube personalities did a this is probably illegal but they took the, they got the pictures like just say like four or five they made a tinder account with a normal bio and the messages they got they couldn't believe it like they were this, like, this just, person was this straight catfishing yeah, it was basically it's catfish, even though their intent wasn't to like take money yeah. or anything. But the messages they got were like, honestly, I have to say, oh, uh, they're it probably has, it, it has to be, be tough. Given to online dating, I'm sure it was in, they were incredibly vulgar type messages. It, it, it's like a double edged sword where like I can see how a, a woman can get the validation, but then some of these messages are like, I can't even repeat them. But you know, it was basically yeah, all oh, the no, things I, you, I, you can you can assume. I mean, I mean, um, I, I'm a, a I have several female friends who've talked about their experience uh, on like online dating, like with uh, I don't I don't know if we're allowed to say, but you, you can imagine any of the apps, and they say just like the number of messages of uh, just male genitalia that receive is like it is they're like they're not even surprised anymore, and it's like wow, like that's a message that a lot of dudes go with. Like I could see yeah. how that would get very annoying as a female. Yeah, I keep mentioning it's just unwanted. I keep mentioning Baudrillard because he's French. I'm going to say this because a French movie, but it's. I think this is happening because I think our society, for some reason, I will not. I think I know why, but our society teaches people that this is what you know the other sex wants, right? Because they're taught like, oh, they want this, they want man, they want what they see basically in uh, pornography and other, let's say, risque mediums. When that's not the reality, right? If you look at like human history or just talk to older generations, you know you know, they just, they just cringe at what's going on now. Right. Cause they're like, this is like totally obscene. Right. Yeah. I but mean, I think, it's just, uh, I, I think, I think social media and like, like online dating, it's just sort of opened up Pandora's box because there's such anonymity, uh, uh, within interactions. Yeah. And, and like, I, I, I've mentioned Baudrillard before where he says like people will start simulating the simulation. I think, I think this stuff doesn't even work, but because there is this illusion that it works, people still do it right and like you say like if you talk to most people this is not something they want to wake up to and see so um <laughs> so it's uh it's, oh, uh, it's, it's right. very intriguing yeah. or from just my experience like uh just being a male yeah i just don't understand like the move to uh when you're talking to someone that you like to like and send a picture of genitalia like that move is just like how how on earth do you think that's going to work it doesn't I can't comprehend that anyway. I, I personally haven't seen it work, but let me know when you do. Um, <laughs> the uh, I, I find that most females say like, this is kind of like gross. 
Now some are into kinky, kinky stuff, but like usually they've been. Well, yeah, yeah, but while, but you know? I guess if you're gonna go with that move, like you shouldn't send anything that's un that's unwarranted or not necessarily wanted, unless it's like explicitly stated to do. Yeah, something. I, I guess to clarify is that like I've seen it like. Anyway, I've heard, of like, I've heard I've heard it working with like what I mean is that our, our whole point I think where we agree is that like people do this on the third message and it's like I just don't understand I think that's well, no, no, no. Like, in the you, I guess that's where I'm going unless it's explicitly asked or wanted you shouldn't do it yeah that's not how it works we already know so yeah. uh, <laughs> anyway so we sort of digress uh, what what did you think of Marcel's character. You know, I I, 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 that was the point I wanted to bring up that like, I felt like he was in many ways an archetype of attributes I see today. And I find that interesting because it's made in 67. So, um, uh, so in what way, like, uh, I, I guess go into more detail with that. Oh, uh, like the infatuation of basically. Oh, sort of like how, what, what you see on Instagram or any of the. Yeah. Like he, like if you, like, this is something that's probably common, right? Like in the sense of like in this world, like you said, like white women are in danger sometimes is because the, the guy goes and he feels a connection, even though they're trained. Well, it's and, it's and beyond a connection. Be friendly. Yeah. yeah. It's, with Marcel, uh, sorry to cut you off, but it's almost like uh, it, it is a sense of entitlement that he feels yeah, with he, uh, Savine. Yeah, he, he thinks that she should be his. Right. And it's, yeah. And it happens a lot with, you know, when people are confused, right? Like they think that just because somebody, especially if it's the opposite sex, uh -huh. they're if they're nice to them, then it means that they're immediately like, oh, infatuated with them. When he clearly pays, or even though she says she wouldn't charge him, but let's say he pays, and well, also, I mean, the, I mean, also, it, also it, the, the the circumstances, right? It's a brothel, right? Like I don't like it, you, it, It's a customer, you know. Uh, it's centric. it's just like no, it's a customer interaction, right? So he's paying for a service but he reads more into it than that and 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 another uh example of this uh you know i finally finished the first season of the girlfriend experience and you see this also in that show where yeah you, you just the, have a very uh obsessive john yeah who, who are basically yeah uh, they who are very dangerous they, 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 they cross the line where they think now that you know they, they read more into it yep. yeah when it's just like her doing a job which the ending of that show is interesting, but I recommend it to the audience. If you like this movie, you'll like that show. Um, the but it's it's like I said, it's it's a job. Like obviously with Savine, it looks like you know she is she's bad. It's to her, it's not just a job, right? It's more of like something that she's battling as a person. Like she's using it as a, a mechanism for something else. But you can see with the other girls that is definitely a profession, and they just they just treat it as a job, right? Nine to five kind of thing. That's it, yeah. And so well, I think there's a big difference between the other two workers there and her because they have they I mean that is their source of income. She comes from money. She didn't have to do it. She's doing it for the thrill. And that's very like um, explicit, right? Especially when she knocks down the vase and she knocks things over. The maid immediately picks it up. Doesn't even have her do anything, right? And then she has a maid. Dude, too. She has maids. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that says it yeah. all. So she doesn't need this for any money. That's why I think she was okay off, often saying like, oh, I don't, I don't have to charge you because she wasn't doing it for the money. Like you said, with the others, it felt like they were trying to, that was her source of income. Mm -hmm. So yeah, with Marcel, I, 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 interesting that dynamic. I think obviously he played the typical criminal. Yeah, um, I, 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 the, I, I mean, I, I think we kind of summed up his character when I, I said that he's the antithesis of her husband. Yeah. And she's every way. He's low class. He's he's grimy. He's uh, not polite. You know. He's very dominating. Dominating. Uh, yeah. He, Every way. Yeah. He even like. I, I will say this. Uh, this is obviously not acceptable. I think in today's society, but like he even like stalk. Like he even has his friend stalk her to find out where she lives so he oh, can yeah. like confront her. What did you think? How he went out though. So now we're, we'll get towards a little bit towards the ending. How'd you, how'd you think that, uh, what'd you think of that sequence? I yeah. mean, he was blinded by, uh, his obsession with her. And so he did whatever he, it took. He's uh, given many of the other decisions, like he, uh, like w with him and his other, um, uh, you know, criminal friend where he just like, he has a, a quick disagreement or he gets insulted immediately pulls off a knife. He's a very reactionary type of character, right? He doesn't really think things through all the time. And he wants to solve every issue or confrontation he has with violence. And that is ultimately seen in the, like some of the final scenes where he shoots uh, uh, <coughs> Sabine's husband three times and then uh, goes out. But I mean, 
I, I and I, I think that's how a lot of unfortunately people who are sort of in the criminal world think is that oh like I'll I'm sort of the one who will never go out right and you see that a yeah. lot with like I, I feel like within uh, narc uh, narcotics track or drug dealers like people who are in that world like you know the danger in it but it seems like overwhelmingly they have the idea of oh yeah I I know people who've died uh, like I, I know it's a dangerous job and like. But it won't happen to me. I feel like that was the same thing with uh, with Marcel, where he's like, "Oh, I'll shoot the husband. Go, I'll get away, and then I'll come uh, find Savine later when things cool down." Where yeah. it's like, ultimately, you know, things are going to end badly. You as an audience, m most people know, like you get involved in that world, it's going to end badly, and it does. He ends up dying. I just love basic, uh, the other thing I, I got to comment on within the whole sequence. I love sort of the pro seeing the progression of like how certain things were shot and like believable back in the 60s or prior and like what's considered like how realistic things have gotten within filmmaking today. Whereas when he gets shot, like you don't even see the bullet. He just covers his chest and just the yeah. falls to the ground. Uh, it's like, wow, that's it's definitely progressed a lot within sort of filmmaking yeah. tactics of death. I, I will say that eventually I think we'll <laughs> I'll, I'll, I have a I have a good list of films I want to get to, but you know when you watch actually some of the films in like the '80s, like specifically speaking of like uh, Bruce Lee or even like Jackie Chan oh. films, you see that like actually a lot of the we've like th those guys <coughs> helped pioneer I think more realistic action sequence because I remember watching like a fr '50s French movie which is actually pretty good, but like they had this whole fight scene Alexis and it was so bad <laughs> that I was just like. It reminded, me, it reminded me of, um, remember, if you watch old Adam West Batman with the mm -hmm. pow and stuff, yeah. literally the sound effects ba barely matched when they hit each other. I was just like, wow. Um, <sighs> it's like a yeah. delay, like a spaghetti western. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was like he would throw the punch, it'd be like, push, and I'm like, okay, come on. <laughs> uh, have you um, ever seen the spaghetti western dub? Yes, I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yeah, that's. Uh, oh, it's. Some of the no, 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 like I'm talking even like more crude. Where they, I, I think, believe like some of the actors, it was like, um, it was like filmed in Italy or like uh, like Italian actors, and then they dub over it, but their mouths would keep moving, and then the yeah, word yeah, would stop. And yeah, yeah, it's the, the, like good that. the good and the bad, the good and the bad, ugly has that problem too. Oh, okay, it's, yeah. a good, it's a good film that I recommend, but it's it has that problem where like I mean, it threw me off the first time I watched it. You're like, why, why are the mouths keep going? Man, yeah, no they, words. They, they, they stop talking, and then it's like. <laughs> It doesn't, yeah, the yeah. dubbing is awful in those films. The uh, but yeah, it's so speaking of like more funny aspects of the movie, I like how like the Marcel's like friend is supposed to be a Spaniard, and you see that they have all these stereotypes of Spaniards. Oh, it's yeah, so funny. and they, and, and they I, were not, this is not a very PC yeah, time or, or film. Yeah, because uh, <laughs> what's funny, like I said in the beginning, that when, when they were racist towards the Chinese businessman. Well, that one, I, I get it because it was European, but you have to remember that the director is, in theory, Spanish. So it's almost as if he's taking shots at, like... At Spain? Yeah, because he's like, oh, you know, the guy acts like an idiot, and, like, they say he can't read, and then, like, you know... Um, uh, remember, because they, remember they make fun of him, like, why are you reading English? You do you know how to read English? And he's just like laughing, and he's just like he starts speaking spang, uh, spoken Spanish, and it's, it's it's hilarious. But it's like, man, there's some. Uh, I guess a lot of exiled, shots taken. I guess what I guess when you're exiled from your country, you feel a bit bitter. <laughs> but uh, the um, but yeah, I, I found that I found that interesting. Also, that plays well, I think, also with the French audience because they usually look down on uh, other uh, European countries. So right in the wheelhouse. So. Um, the uh it, it is it is it, it reminded me of like how, like how the french are sometimes uh, there's this modern family episode where they go to paris Modern family is a funny well it's declined but it's a funny tv com american comedy but they go to paris and like everybody's like so smug and in the end the one of the characters just embraces his americanism he says like where's mcdonald's and he just points <laughs> because he asks like the like food and they just say oh mcdonald's that way and at first he's offended he's like why you just assume i want to go to mcdonald's but at the end he's just like you know what i love mcdonald's so uh, <laughs> so it's one of those things where it's uh i mean you know people who really like french culture obviously like will, will slam me and defend them but 
I, they have that reputation for a reason. Okay. Like, you know, it's, it is, it is well known that even if you're not American, you're some like British or Spanish that they, well, they, they, to... they uh, what I always find funny. And I don't know if a lot of people are familiar with this dynamic, but they, they get so annoyed by um, people who live in Quebec uh, because they, they say, Oh, uh, they speak French in Quebec. That's our main language. But they, they talk smack saying that they, uh, you know, butcher the language that it's awful because it's Quebec French. It's not like the authentic French, uh, French. Yeah. Well, it, it reminds me of they, what happened with the, the people that the French were that went to Quebec. It's kind of like what happened with, um, with Australia where like the, the criminals went lower class people went. Mm -hmm. So their accent, um, their accent actually is, is from that lineage of like a lower class. Mm -hmm. While like obviously, if you it's listen like, to like, isn't like Cockney, where I I I might be butchering that in terms of like, um, yeah, what, what was the name for uh, lower, sort of the lower socioeconomic people who would speak uh, British or English? Yeah, and so it's, it's it's a similar dynamic there where the accent has kept on, um, and obviously. I think for, what's ironic is that French people like to go to Quebec just to show their former empire, but it's uh, yeah, like it's it but it's from, I'm gonna quote a uh, quote I've heard is that like it bothers their ear because like it doesn't sound 100 percent correct. Forget them. I actually really like uh, Quebec when I went. The uh, it's it's okay. The uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> well, don't worry. There's people I know that like they love that area. But, um, I actually really liked the sort of. Uh, it was very interesting going there, and I, I know you went to Montreal. Uh, yeah, this year, right. I was I, I was corrected Mon many Mon times. Montreal? Went, no, Montreal. So. Montreal. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but it was very interesting because um, at least when I was in that part, you know, I, I would say you would hear French and English fifty percent of the time, right? Um, I'm not going to say it in, in the way you said it, but Montreal is. Uh, you know, it's a very international type city, but my friend and I, when we went this is years ago, we drove up to uh, Quebec City, and man, no one spoke English there. It was just French everywhere. So we were trying to get by with like the very few words of French that we know, but it, it was very different uh, within those two cities. Yeah, it's because <coughs> with, with Montreal, it's it is it's a tourist hub, so you have to speak some English. But it's true that like. Um, but you get a you get a different experience because like I went with uh, my mom who's a French speaker and like mm -hmm. we went to a store and it, it's it, it's interesting how like how when my mom speaks to the cash register they're so friendly nice and then the uh, let's say more American tourist comes and it's like oh yeah here it's over there it's like wait a second here where's customer service should be uh, this sounds looks prejudiced to me and, and I walked out it's of the store because you I, don't I was, speak the language like, yeah I was ticked I was like that's messed up like you should at least like treat people like the same they're they're trying to buy no. products too. Uh, it, 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 I mean, it's the same way in, in pretty much any language. If you like go, if you went to China and you started speaking Mandarin fluently, they'd be like, whoa. And they, they'd probably just be more receptive. So, or like if you go to Mexico or uh, like yeah. Spain. Yeah, it's the same thing. I've never seen such snobbiness in my life. But anyway, <laughs> the, uh... <laughs> Wait, was this in Paris or was this in France? This was in Montreal. Montreal. No, in Paris, I had even a worse experience where we're asking for help. And I was with no Oh, no, they won't help. Like, I was asking for won't. help at the freaking train, and they were like, oh, no English. I'm like, yeah, I was pretty good right there. <laughs> I mean, okay. Uh, I was like, you guys are snobbish. They, they really don't like American tourists. So. But if you speak French, it's like you're basically local, so it's fine. Well, but um, if you don't speak French, you know, in a good way, or if you have an accent, a lot of French won't speak to you in French. Yeah, that's true too. Because they say that you're butchering their language. Yeah, so they, they won't. Yeah, it's it's one of those things where like I've been told where if either you you really know what you're doing or you don't try. So it's one of those. There's no in between. How like you know how you normally can go to Spain you may, or even Mexico and maybe pretend to speak and they'll just be like ah, you know, they'll laugh at you a little bit. They'll be like, okay, I know what you're getting at. There it's like you try. I'm sorry. Stop. Uh, what's what's interesting is that like after my experience in Paris, it was the one time that. Uh, here another TV. Here's another TV reference. So there's that episode in The Simpsons where Homer goes to like Italy and he he's he uh, he's getting his luggage and then he takes out the American flag. He goes USA USA. That was the only time I was like, I wish I could do. I wish I could this leave like, freaking France and go like 
World War II chairs back to back. You <laughs> back know? to back. <laughs> Saved your country. Dude. Yeah, man, I was so ticked. Do you understand how pissed I was that day, dude? I was like, I need help. And like, really, you're going to pull that? No, you're, you're like a public servant. I'm not asking a stranger. I'm asking you at the freaking teller, dude. Like, you kidding me? Um, I was like. It is what it is. Guy. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I've, never, I've never had quite that rude, rude of receptiveness uh, when I've traveled or traveled abroad. Have you been to France yet? I have, but I was much younger at that point, so I couldn't ask for directions. But uh, like when I went to China, you know, I couldn't speak a lick of Mandarin, but we were sort of communicating, and they were actually very helpful. Uh, and these were random people at a mall in, in uh, Beijing. Yeah, because they understand common decency. The, uh, <laughs> um, but uh, okay, I'll stop slamming. Anyway, anyway <laughs> you, you're, if we have any French viewers here, you're really gonna like uh, hurt us in that market. But anyway. Yeah. So uh, let's move on. What did you think of the ending? Since we're, we're, we're pretty close to wrapped up with the film. Yeah, with the ending, I, I it's one of the more intriguing endings I've seen in recent memory. Because, like, first of all, what do you think of Henri's? Uh, it's like, in my opinion, it's such a French because I've seen more French films uh, probably than you have. It's such a French thing to say when Henri, like, uh, when uh, she, he tells when he's uh, like, I'm not no longer into you. No, no, but remember when she's like, uh, when he, he gives her her reasoning for why I'm going to tell you're basically, uh, to give a little recap, you mentioned the shooting, right? He ends up going to the hospital, ends up basically. Uh -huh. um, and you know, and uh, uh, the husband or his wife's actions are directly responsible within that time or with, within that scenario for her husband being shot. Um, and paralyzed. And paralyzed. Yeah. yeah. And then. So, uh, but Henri says to her, right? Like, Oh, I need. I should. I'm gonna tell him like all the things you've. You're, you're basically the escort because you know it's unfair to him suffering, thinking like he's putting such a burn on such a beautiful wife. I was like, first of all, but even only, before, only so that kind of only his character would say something like that would be his reasoning, not like oh, you know, I, I think it should come out and we should, you know, he he you know deserves to know because he's a good guy. No, that's the reasoning. I was just like, that's such a freaking French thing to say. <laughs> but even before that, um, because uh, in, in one of the scenes we skipped. Uh, you know, Henri goes to uh, uh, Savine's pl yeah, place of work and, uh, like, sees her there and then ca sort of catches her. But then she, she she's, like, mad. Uh, she's kind of mad that she had been found out, right? And uh, she never really likes Henri, but she's like, fine, do, what, do whatever you please. And he's like, no, no, no. He's like, what I liked about you was the idea that you were, you know, the wife of... Uh, you know, so, sort of an innocent wife of, uh, you, you know, basically someone who's in, in the aristocracy, which her husband, because they're in that, they have that level of wealth. But uh, he's like, now that I, I see, you know, that, that you're in this line of work and in this business, he's like, oh, I'm, not, I'm no longer interested. I was like, oh, okay, that's that's very interesting. It was more sort of the idea of her, uh, of her innocence is what he liked about her. Yeah, and, and when she was knocked down her perch, it was like a turn off for him because she was she yeah. became not a goddess but human in his eyes, and so he wanted to, I guess, do that benefit for his friend, right? And give him the truth. Man, that must be brutal to hear that truth when you're kind of paralyzed. But uh, the can't imagine. But uh, you know, the also she doesn't go in the room with him, so there's always that speculation that what did he actually say, right? Mm -hmm. And and then also there's that, that scene is. where. So yeah. that was interesting because they left and towards the end of the film they left a lot of ambiguity in it. Yeah, because I was gonna say like, because like you said, there's the hint that like what actually happened through this whole movie because obviously yeah, was that all her sort of that scenario was that all made up in her head or did that actually happen? Exactly really because know. yeah, because like you know he's in, <clears throat> like he leaves and she goes and he's supposedly crying right and then they flip to the surrealism right. And, you know, he's walking again and then like, you know, you, you, they look out the window and they're back into the park they were in the beginning. So you're left with kind of like a shell shock of like, wait, was this a dream? What was real? What wasn't real? Um, my my interpretation, my guess is everything's interpretation. I think that most, I think there's this, I think there's most of the surrealism is her mind. And so I'm going with the theory that that last scene is how she I guess how she's going to be coping with this new reality where she's going to take care of her husband, but she'll probably like still, you know, have, I'm going to say have fun, but I, I, I think events happen, but there was the argument that like, maybe it was all fictional. Like it was all, yeah, it was I all mean, fantasy in her head, you know? 
you don't really know, but if it was true, I can imagine in that scenario her husband would stay with her. You know, I'm not from the aristocracy, but a lot of times, like... You'll do it just to save face? Yes, because... No names here, but I, I came across a situation once where I met somebody uh, who was, uh, he was... He was American, but he was married into basically... I'm not even going to say high-level British aristocracy, but, you know, um, he, he was married to somebody who was like a maid for queen victoria and actually uh -huh. got her wealth that way her family did and he 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 actually traveled abroad to have affairs so that he would it wouldn't come up in so the wife understood that like you do that go to different countries do that but don't do that in here because you know in polite british society it's going to come out and it's going to look bad you know and i i don't know if they ever got divorced but you know that that was i got this peek into that <laughs> world where i think you and i would divorce but I don't know how uh, these people it, think that that, yeah. that goes into different cultural differences, right? Like within French society, it's not that uncommon. And I know it's sort of a stereotype, but it is kind of true. And even in Latin America, you hear about this of uh, like people having mistresses. Yeah. Right. Uh, you know, and you hear about that. <laughs> we are like, we even know some of some people in Mexico that this has happened to where, yeah, you turns out like the husband had another family kind of deal and so it's just weird because here in the u.s that's just not like the concept of having mistresses is just not acceptable right like i'm sure it happens but most of the time if you if like a wife finds out you then it ends up in divorce whereas like within french society i feel like it's more common or commonplace to do it as long as like the wife doesn't know about it or it doesn't come out if from my my understanding they don't view adultery the same way probably i think a lot of uh like american america, Amer american is like basically a protestant nation so a lot of protestants don't have that kind of wiggle room but it, it still blows my mind because france is historically a french nation yeah i mean it's it's one of those things where uh, I, I, i'm been... sorry Fr france is historically I, I, I think i said a french nation france is uh, like historically a catholic country yeah it's it's, so it's they, very it's true, so religious though. Yeah, it's still it's still very intriguing. Yeah, it's it's almost as if like I don't know what I haven't done enough reading about what was it like in the you know the 19th and 18th century, but I suspect also there's that dynamic of class where I think that like obviously the aristocrats they have other needs and desires and saving face is important. Uh, but also I think it's also t part of the that transition, right? When we went from the 50s and 60s to the modern age, I think I think we could we could definitely say that like the French were ahead in terms of like uh, social no uh, gender norms and stuff like that than the American movement was in the '60s too. So um, just through media and like literature, you can you can kind of pick up on this. And like I said, a lot of our great uh, po postmodernist philosophers are French. So they're yeah they're destructuralists. So um, I think there's also that heritage too. That because you got to remember in Paris there is a red light district that is completely acceptable so could you imagine that in new york or dc no right you have to go to nevada for that kind of stuff so that's i think right there you see like sure. a stark difference though yeah yeah no, i agree so anyway i i mean we we sort of have uh covered most of the things with uh or most of the timeline most of the plot within the film um so do you have any other final thoughts before we get into sort of mm. ratings yeah, I'm trying to think if we maybe something I missed that I want to discuss, but I think we hit the stuff I wanted to. I wanted to talk about gender, uh, 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 like the uh, I, you know, the idea of being in love with the escort. I can't remember anything else, but uh, no, I think I think we covered everything. Like there was the surreal sequences. Yeah, I mean, I and nothing pops to my mind. So I think we we definitely had a good discussion here. I think it's a film that definitely. I will say that I, before we get into ratings, I will say this is a movie that. It's definitely for people who are interested in like film, like the history of film or even like films from different like cultures. Like we did Burning, which was interesting. In our oh, yeah. But this movie is interesting also because you see that I give a lot of credit in the sense that like the time period too. And like the, and then for a film that is that old, not many films age that well. You know, I, I've seen some old films where I go, eh, you know, I'm watching it because I'm interested in movies, but I wouldn't rewatch this like multiple times. So. Mm -hmm. 
And this is one that like in, in six months, I'd be completely comfortable watching this if I was in like a high society cocktail uh, f French uh, <laughs> film uh, expose. So uh, those exist by the way, so. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I would say for me, I think the, like, I, I thought it was, it was a pretty good film, but the rewatchability is just not there for me personally. I feel like I've seen it, I've seen it once and then that's pretty much it for me. I don't, I don't know if it's a, it's a rewatch type of film. Yeah, there wasn't there wasn't much I picked up the second time, but I will say that like I was surprised that maybe because it's not so long either. Like if it was two hours, I would have been like, "This is too long." But it was like what an hour and thirty, uh, or oh, it was an hour hour forty. Oh, interesting, because I felt like it was. I kind of watched through it pretty like both no, times. No, like it just it, just, it run, felt like runtime like a... run is just shy of an hour forty. Okay, it's one hundred and one minutes. Yeah. Okay. Well, an hour forty-one. Huh. So maybe we've just been watching some long movies, <laughs> and I'm like, oh man. I don't think we really have recently. Yeah. There I were Burning was, long. Uh, Burning aside, was like. Oh, Burning was great. How, how, aside from Stalker, long? Stalker was the longest. Stalker was like two hours and forty minutes. I guess it's that sometimes when you hit, we hit that like two hour and let's say over, let's say two fifteen, two twenty. Sometimes with some movies, I do feel like the length is a long. Stalker. Uh, yeah, but even like I th I'm trying to remember. Stalker was long. Even you, you, even you said you had to. Uh, yeah, burning, watch burning was uh, burning was 148 minutes, which I really did enjoy. But I, I for some, I I even, with those kind of, well, even with those kind of movies, I do feel like I think I've got maybe because we're doing this this podcast now. I do feel like most movies now, like if they're under two hours, it's like candy now. I can maybe it's just I'm just getting maybe yeah. what's the term? I'm getting a tolerance for it because before I, I felt like oh even like an hour like you said an hour 30 hour 45 felt longish, but now it's like. I, it's like breakfast. It's kind of crazy. So maybe we're just watching too many movies. So. Um, we're quite a few. Uh, we can get into. But yeah, anyway, yeah, want. let's go ahead. Um, since this is your film, I'll let you go first, or your pick. Yeah, maybe I'll surprise you with my rating because uh, I talk highly about this film and I do enjoy it. But to me, it's the same kind of tier as Pie, and that's why I'm sticking with a seven out of ten. Ooh, so this might be the first film where I go lower. I'm actually going a six and a half on this one. Part of it is because the rewatchability for me is not quite there. It was interesting that they touched upon uh, some taboo topics, but in many ways, and I, I guess this might be some of the advances in sort of directing as a whole. I haven't watched a lot of films in the 60s, uh, so this just might be sort of my ignorance within the time. But uh, yeah, some of the foreshadowment that they tried to, I know they try to make it subtle, but to me when I was watching, I, I know I brought up the scene with the wheelchair, but some of the, the foreshadowing was just too over the, like, it was not subtle. It, it was the complete opposite of subtle. And it's like, okay, well, obviously, you know, that dude staring at the wheelchair, he's going to end up, so, the wheelchair is going to come back in some way or the other at the end. Right. And it does. And it's very clear. But yeah, some of the things that uh, the foreshadowing that they, I guess, try to make subtle, it just wasn't there in the choice. Like, I wish they had done it. In, a, in more subtle ways than they than they did in the film, right? Yeah. To to your point, I'm I've been trying to open my repertoire with older films. So when I say older films, I'm saying basically 75 or lower, like 1975 or before. And I will say that like it it's like it reminds me of like I'm gonna do this analogy. Let's see if it hits. It reminds me when you start drinking like alcohol, where like at the first you're like, what's so great about it? It takes. It's a it's a taste thing. It's you gotta uh, develop it. I, a, it's tough. Yeah. It's I tough have a better things. analogy. It's like trying to get used to the style of play of say the NBA in the sixties. Very different from today. Yeah. I feel like that's the same thing with like films. Yeah, I agree. It's one of those things where you have to grow to appreciate, even though like this film I think is just solid. I don't think it's like, oh, it's the best movie I've seen from the sixties or fifties or whatever. I thought it was but good. I, I but a lot of like I've seen a lot of reviews and people calling this a classic film. I don't know. I didn't. I, I guess maybe because of the topics that were discussed, but I didn't view it in that way. I think it's so. It's one of those films. You know how I think maybe this was off camera, but I know you talked before about how like Re *Requiem for a Dream* was overhyped and it was the filmmaker's film. I've noticed that this movie comes up a lot in uh, film uh, courses, so I think there is this already this bias towards like you know. I think it has to do with the fact that they were, this film was discussing all many taboo topics for the time. And then the ending, obviously, it's like, whoa, you weren't quite expecting that. What do they mean? 
But you also I, have to... I think I've seen yeah. too many films with like ending twists kind of in that way where it's like, it's not as unique. Whereas if I had seen this film before I'd seen many other films, maybe it would rate it higher. Cause I could think yeah. of like say inception had sort of similar, a similar ending, things like that. Yeah. I, I think a lot of the techniques we see in this movie, I think we've, maybe to the director's credit, we have seen now over and over again. Yeah, and he may have been the one who pioneered it. It's just, I, I'm just, uh, I'm a product of some of my bias in terms of like what films I've already seen. Yeah, I, I think this movie is still, I, to your, I'm trying to like answer your question about like why maybe it's like, has all these <clears throat> reviews as classic. And I think it's because it comes up in a lot of curriculum and I think it become it comes up because it's part of the, I, I'm, I'm with you a little bit where I think this this like, quote unquote French new age filmmaking, maybe because we've seen a lot of the benefits because of like, you know, the eighties, nineties and now, but th that era of like, you know, late fifties up to the early seventies is considered like French new film, which a lot of actually older directors that we like now, they cite a lot of these movies that they like in mm -hmm. that period. Um, they probably have refined and perfected the techniques because, you know, we have great films today. Yeah. So I think that's why also, like you said, a lot of people consider it a classic. I, I watched the film and I was also a bit surprised that people say it's like, you know, a like a quote unquote class. I think it is one of those films that probably if you're a, a film historian, it's probably on your list to watch because yeah, it's probably like part, it, it, part of that journey. But our podcast, we're, we're basically two guys on the couch. Like we're, we're just talking, talking about it. Things, I so. mean, so I think we both would agree so far the, the best film we, we, we've seen and rated was Burning. And that's like a film I would consider to be a classic. Yeah, it's actually that one is probably going to be underrated because I don't know if that film will be, enter a lot of curriculum. I think this oh film enters a lot God. of curriculum because of the time period. So it helps, right? Being part of the French New Age uh, era. Dude, all um, the tricks, the editing, the cuts within Burning were just phenomenal. I, there was not one thing that I could necessarily point to that was a weakness of the film. Yeah. So I, th I think that covers. It. I think our ratings are fair. Like I, I don't think six point five. I can even see myself going there. But I, I now I'm a bias of our my previous rating. So I was like, I feel like Pi and this film are probably in the same kind of ballpark of. Like, see, I, I, I like Pi, but I think it was more because of that indie aesthetic of it, the feel that it gave you, and plus I really love the soundtrack. This is a good soundtrack. Yeah. Yeah. So. But to, to not take anything away from this film where I will say that like I understand why it's part of curriculum and why it's um, to I'm going to say to film theaters buffs. Uh, yeah. buffs or like people who study this as part of their like I don't want to say career, but like, you know, they study they study like they study film theory and, and, and things like this. I can see why it's on that list. So that's where yeah. I'll say that. Sure. All right. Well, All right, I man. think that concludes this week's episode. Stay tuned for episode 19 where we will be reviewing uh, the cult classic uh, uh, Scottish, Scottish, or Brit I, I would just say UK film, uh, Train Spotting. You can so just say British film, but yeah. British, yeah. Because <laughs> that, that encompasses everything. Uh, yeah, that should be it, a fun one. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. It takes place in Edinburgh. So. Edinburgh. Yeah. Okay. Well, stay tuned until next week. We'll see you later. See it.